Thank you for joining me, and I'm glad that you're all here. Today, our intended topic is accounting systems, financial systems, and other things you need to manage your business, in addition to all of the other things that we already work on with landing pages and funnels and scheduling and payment gateways and everything else. Um, today's topic is accounting, and that's an honor of usually our United States tax uh, filing deadline is usually April 15th. This year, it's been pushed back to May 17th. But anyway, in the spirit of the original tax day, I just wanted to talk a little bit about accounting systems and uh, financial tools that you might use in your business. So let's get started. Uh, first of all, accounting is one of those things that is kind of like I don't know, it's kind of like insurance or something like, you know, you need it, you know, that it's kind of a good idea and, you know, you will have to do it, but you really don't like it, don't want to know about it. And, and all of those other, uh, I don't know what the right word is, aversions, let's call it. So let's just be clear that accounting, while it does sound a little bit, you know, intimidating, all it really means is keeping track of what you're doing. And you're basically doing that anyway in a bunch of different ways. Like, for instance, if you have Keep or Infusionsoft or Active Campaign or wherever you are keeping track of your sales or in ClickFunnels or any place else where you are selling products, you have a record in those systems of the sales that you've made. And likewise, when you are uh, paying bills, like when you pay all the subscriptions for all the different systems you use, when you pay uh, any other bills that you have, like your insurance bills or your electricity or your internet or your phone, all those bills, you're paying them anyway, and those payments are recorded. So it's not like accounting is making you do something really different. What accounting does is it pulls all the stuff that you're doing anyway into one place so that you can then see it and analyze it. Because uh, like they say, knowledge is power and you can't make a good decision without good information. So I prefer uh, QBO, which is QuickBooks Online, but there are several other systems that work you know, just as well. Uh, again, accounting is accounting, and it's a function of two things. One, ease of use, and two, price. Uh, QuickBooks Online, QBO, it, they, it's kind of like everybody else these days. If you catch them on a good day, they're having a sale, and it's not very expensive. And if you don't catch them on a good day and you pay full price, I believe the last time on CA, they change it so often, I'm not even sure. It's usually like around $50 a month for the basic type of, of accounting that does not include payroll processing. And what I like to do with QBO, and you can do it with any of the other, well, most of the other accounting systems, is I connect the accounting system to my bank accounts and to my business credit card accounts. And that way, every time I either write a check or if I charge something on my debit card or if I charge something on a credit card, because those accounts are connected to my accounting system, they automatically are available in my accounting system. So I don't have to write them down. I don't have to save the receipts to know what I did. I just go in and I open up my QBO. And what happens is it downloads all the activity into a screen. It doesn't just put them in your books without you looking at them. Although that is a setting that you can do, I'd recommend you don't do that. What it does is it pulls them down into a transaction screen where you can then look at them and make sure that it's what you expected and that the amounts are right and you didn't overpay or underpay or whatever. And then you just say, yeah, that's right. And then it will move into your uh, permanent records. The first time that you download each type of an expense, like let's say you just signed up and you paid your first $97 and you paid it with your business credit card and that credit card is connected to your QBO. So when you go into QBO, that payment is going to have downloaded from your credit card into your accounting records and it's just going to be sitting there saying $97 was paid with the Visa card and it went to ClickFunnels. Now, right there, it isn't in your records yet, but you have the opportunity to do two things. One, indicate what account that goes to. For instance, I put it into subscriptions. 
that's the account that I use for the different software, uh, software subscriptions actually, because I also have other subscriptions. So then all I do is the first time that ClickFunnels shows up in my feed, I go in and I, first of all, uh, verify that it is valid and that I do want that in my books. And then I, there's a spot that say, what account do you want this to be uh, a tagged with? And I, it drops down and I find subscriptions. I say that's subscriptions. And then it says, do you want to add this to your records? And I say, yes. So that saves the transaction with that account, puts it in my actual books, and then it stops and it asks me a question. And it says, every time you see $97 coming from ClickFunnels, do you always want it to go into the subscriptions expense account? And I say, yes. So from forevermore, whenever that transaction is going to be in the next month or any other subsequent month's transactions, it will already have the subscriptions account attached to it. So that when I review it, not only do I see the date, who it was to, what the amount was, but I also see which account it's going to be entered into in my books. So now all I have to do is just look and say, yep, that's good. And now all of that activity, all the things that I spent money on, all of all the expenses that I had for my business are now automatically in my accounting records. And similarly with the income, now the income is a little bit trickier because we have normally in a um, brick and mortar kind of a business. Now, if you were a coach or a consultant or a speaker, what you would do is you would send invoices out for if you're a, a consultant, you would bill by the hour and you would send an invoice for the number of hours that you worked and with a description of what you did and how much it was per hour and what the total was. You would invoice the client through your accounting system. They would either send a check or pay it with Stripe or PayPal or something. And all of that activity with the client's name, what it was for, what the amount was, is already in your accounting system in that situation. Well, in the online world, most of us don't do that. Most of us don't necessarily send an hourly bill, although we can. And in that case, you might want to have your hourly billable clients set up as customers inside of your accounting system. But for the most part, if you're doing group coaching, you, there's really no need to have each of, let's say you had 20 people in your group coaching program. You really don't need those 20 people set up as individual customers in your accounting system because you're not gonna send them invoices. They're not gonna send in checks. Everything is really gonna be happening online. So what you do, which makes it easier is for instance, I use Infusionsoft, which is now called Keep, Keep Max Classic. I don't know how going to three words instead of one word is an improvement, but I guess it is. And in Keep, Max Classic, I have all of my customers, all of my clients are in there. Everything that I have done with them, if I've done a consulting session with them, I've billed them through Infusionsoft. They have paid with Stripe. And what I do at the end of the month, because all of my individual client records is in Keep, I don't need to duplicate that in my accounting system. All I really need to put into my accounting system is the total amount of the revenue for the month. Like what did I bill and what was the type of revenue? So if it was group coaching, I would have a group coaching revenue account. If it was one-on-one -on -one consulting, I would have a consulting income revenue account, et cetera. So you can use Zapier to connect your keep to QuickBooks. And then at that point, when the deposits come from Stripe and the amount is in your bank account, you can then match it up to what the uh, activity was from your revenue that was generated and recorded in, in my case, Keep or Infusionsoft. So that sounds like it's kind of complicated. I recognize as I'm saying it out loud, I'm going, oh, wait a minute, that doesn't really sound as quick and easy as it is, but it really is. And once you set it up, it's the type of thing, like a lot of the stuff that we do in our business with automations, once you set up a, an automation, like an email sequence, Everybody today, tomorrow, a month from now, a year from now, everybody who takes whatever that action is to get them into that sequence, it's going to happen automatically without you having to touch it. And the same thing is true with your accounting. Once you set it all up, it's going to happen automatically without you having to touch it. So 
the reason I wanted to bring this up is because now it's almost tax time here in the US. And when you go to do your tax return, you need to have all of your activity in your business recorded and it needs to be categorized so that you can transfer the information from your own counting records onto your tax return. And they have a line for income, they have a line for utilities expense and uh, subscription expense and office expense and all the different expenses that businesses have. And you can go right from your accounting system, you can just take those totals and put them on your uh, income tax return. Now, one of the other reasons that I like using QuickBooks is because it's owned by Intuit and Intuit also owns TurboTax. So if you use QuickBooks or QBO, it's very easy to transfer your information from your records in QuickBooks over to TurboTax. So you start, start your tax return with most of it already done. So that's another reason why I like automating. And speaking of having everything already done, uh, who here does their bank recs monthly? Uh, I can't raise my hand consistently. I try to, but a bank reconciliation is when you take your bank statement and back in the day, it was a paper bank statement and you would pull your bank statement out and then you would look at your records, in my case, QuickBooks, and then you would say, okay, uh, the bank shows a deposit of $500 on the third of the month. And then I look in my accounting system and make sure, yep, there's $500 on the third of the month. And then you check it off as cleared because it matches. Well, think about uh, how long that would take manually. And it wasn't, in a small business, it really wasn't that big of a deal, unless there was something that was not working and then it would be difficult to find it. But think about if you get your bank statement and the things that are in your accounting system came from the bank or from your credit card statement. So in other words, instead of you having to type everything in and then match it to the bank statement, the activity that has happened has already been recorded at the bank and at the credit card company. And then those, those transactions are now in your books because they came from the bank or from the credit card company, you know that they're there and they match. So they're cleared the second they come into your account, into your accounting, because that's where they came from. So the only thing that you really have to do other than that is, uh, is unusual things. Like I had somebody pay me with Venmo once and I don't have Venmo set up as an actual business payment method, but all I did was record that one payment in my QuickBooks as a, as a, I called it an online payment. And that way, when the bank statement came in and it saw an electronic deposit and it matched that manual Venmo deposit that I put into my QuickBooks, then I had to manually clear that because it didn't, the Venmo wasn't in my attached and in, in, uh, connected systems. But other than those unusual one-offs uh, occasionally, pretty much 99 to 95% of everything you do can be connected to your accounting. So at the end of the month, it takes you literally, most months it takes me about 30 seconds to do my bank reconciliation. And then maybe if I've started some new expenses and what have you, like new subscriptions, I have to look at those transactions, decide which bank, which accounting account I want to charge them to and just indicate that. So, you know, in those situations, um, I try to download, well, obviously at least once a month, but I try to do it weekly. And if you're doing the downloads into your system weekly, it just takes a couple of minutes. So at the end of the month, literally everything is done and basically no time flat. And then at the end of the year, you've got your financial statements, which are basically automatic because you've been doing this all along the way for the year. Now, an income statement, remember, that's the thing we use for our tax return. It has your income at the top. It has all of your expenses underneath it. Then it totals the expenses. You subtract your expenses from your income and there's your profit and or loss. And please don't fret the first few years, you're either going to have a very small profit or maybe you're gonna have a loss. And the loss, while it's disheartening, it's actually an investment. And it's hard to see a loss when you're working so hard in your business. But re remember that doing what you need to do and spending the money that you need to spend to get your business running, that not only is an, ex an expense for your business, but it's, it's such an investment in your future. 
And at least in the U.S. for tax purposes, if your business loses money this year, if this is the first year that you're running your business or last year was your first year and you're doing the taxes for last year now, the fact that you had a loss, while it's disheartening, is not the end of the world. And because you're reporting that loss next year, let's say next this year, let's say you had a loss of $10,000, let's say over the course of the year. And then next year, your business grows and you've got more clients and you've got more activity and you're making more money. And at the end of the year, next year, you've got a profit of $20,000, let's say. Well, because you had that $10,000 loss in the previous year, you can reduce the profitable uh, taxable amount from the following year with the $10,000 loss from the previous year. And then you only pay taxes on what's left, which would be the 10,000. So while losses are not good and we don't strive to have them, if you do remember that you get to, uh, in the US, you get to apply the loss from previous years to the years when you start making a profit. And that is, about the only bright spot that I can think of when you have a loss in your business. Uh, the other thing I just wanna mention, if uh, you're thinking about getting yourself set up and uh, having some accounting records, not only do you need an accounting system, but I find using spreadsheets for planning and for thinking and for doing what ifs, is are, they're just great. So if you're thinking about, uh, you wanna have a new lower tier, lower ticket, uh, product of some kind. You, a, a spreadsheet is the perfect place to do some what ifs. Like for instance, let's say your low ticket item is, I don't know, $47, $97, whatever it is. And you you can make projections, which that's fun to do. And I think I, I do caution you though, because it's always easy for us to say, oh yeah, I'll sell a hundred of them a month. And you really have no idea if you will, and you have no idea how you will, but you think that sounds good. So I don't like to do those types of big estimates of revenue without some data driving it. But what I do like to do uh, spreadsheets for is to look at what are the expenses. So for instance, if I'm going to be doing a low ticket uh, product of some type, what, what is it costing me to do that? What is it costing me to put that low ticket product out there? And if it's something that I already have built and it doesn't involve any one-on-one -on -one or any group coaching or any time of me to, to invest in it as we go along, well, then it's basically uh, feeding itself, if you will, because it's not costing you anything as you go along. So I like to look at the costs of everything that I'm going to develop. So if it's going to take me an hour of my time a week, I put that value in as a cost and then I look at what the possible revenue is. And then that helps you make a decision as to whether that is a profitable idea. And remember that not every idea needs to be profitable because sometimes just like stores will have what they call loss leaders, which is they have something that's like a ridiculously low price. For instance, Costco's rotisserie chicken, it costs them more than $4.99 each to make them, but it brings people in the door. So you might do the same type of a thing with a low ticket item where technically you're not really making any money because it's costing you a little bit to get that product out there. But if you get enough people to get interested in it and they are going to buy something else from you in the future, that is almost like a marketing expense. So don't let the fact that something's going to cost you a little bit more than what, it, what, it, what it's going to bring in, don't let that turn you off from the whole idea. That's good for like getting your business out there and getting people to get to know you. Obviously, future uh, products do need to be profitable. That's part of uh, being a good business person. If you're not, in the end, paying all of your expenses, paying yourself, paying your taxes, and then having money left over, then it's not really a business. It's more of a hobby. And hobbies cost money. They don't make money. Hey, Terry. Nice to see you. I'm glad you could join us. Um, there was one other thing that I wanted to, let me just before, oh yes. This is something I do every year and I do it usually in January and it's called a subscriptions audit where what I do is when I'm going through all of the expenses that are hitting my, my books 
I look and see all the subscriptions. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was first starting, I really didn't know what I was going to need for sure. So if something looked good and it was only $9.99 a month, I would sign up. And so the first, after the first year, uh, all these things were starting to renew. And I looked and I literally had seven things that I had signed up for somewhere throughout the year. And one of them was $9.99, one of them was $4.99, one of them was $19.99, et cetera. But there were seven of them. And the seven of them added up to more than $100 a month. And because, you know, $4.99, $12.99 doesn't seem like a lot, you almost ignore it. But when I do my subscription audit, I go through and I see every single subscription that's in my accounting that I paid for last year. And then I look at it and I decide, did I even know I still have that? Because sometimes I don't. And then I say, do I need it? And this past year, I actually canceled four different things that I had uh, subscribed to, two of which I was thinking I still might use, but I'm like, I'm not using it yet. So I canceled it. And the other two, I never really use. Like I got onto the free, like 17, you know, 14 days, seven day free. And then I said, okay, I'm going to pay for it for a few months while I figure it out. And then a few months went by and I just never got back to it. So I really highly recommend that you do a subscription audit at least once a year to see what it is you're actually paying for, because I found it to be pretty eye-opening. All right. Oh, thank you, Terry. <laughs> okay. Well, the, Terry, do you have any questions here? I don't know if anyone else has any questions. Uh, that is really everything that I wanted to discuss. Um, if anybody would like some more information about accounting or about getting things set up, and I also want to let you know that if you have uh, never done an accounting system and you really want, you don't even know where to start, just reach out to me and uh, let me, and I could give you a little bit of free advice. It's not like I'm not asking you to hire me to do your accounting. I'm not going to do your accounting, but I could certainly give you some advice and help you get on the right foot. And Terry, you no know, good failure to launch. I know the failure to launch is something that we all go through and. I think this is off topic that nothing to do with financial or accounting, but in the failure to launch concept, what I think we all come into the business with the idea that we, first of all, we've got a great idea. We wouldn't be doing this to begin with. And we're positive that we can help so many people and we don't understand why we're not selling more than we think we should. And I think at least in my case, and it might be in your case as well, I think what I find is I know a lot about what people need in their online business. And I've been doing it for so many years and I know I can do a good job. The problem is I don't always approach it from my client's point of view. So I go at it telling them the things that I know and the way I do it and the way I understand it because I do understand it. And sometimes I forget to go back to where I didn't already know this and I don't present it in the right terms. I don't use the right words. I don't make the point that hits them where they live. And that has been one of my big uh, challenges. And last year, my whole, I spent a lot of time getting a 12, I didn't, thank God I did not build the whole 12 modules. Uh, what I did was I built the first module, started talking about it in my own Facebook group and in other Facebook groups I was a member of, and discovered that my 12, you know, it was 12 weeks, 12 months, whatever you want it to be. And what I did was I just went through every single thing that people need to do when they start a business. And what I just, and, and to me, it was brilliant because it was everything. And I was just so sure that anybody that did this course was going to be so well prepared and going to be so successful. And I could not understand why people who I thought would be my ideal clients weren't interested at all. And when I talked to them, what I discovered was nobody wanted to wait till week six to get the answer to their email automation problem that they have today. And nobody wanted to wait till week three to get the information that they needed for whatever problem they were having today. So after all of that excitement, and like Terry says, I was working on it for literally a couple of months. And then basically that wasn't what people wanted. 
So I had to pivot. And now I'm what I've been doing now for the last six or seven months is doing the, the done with you. So instead of the 12 week course that I thought I was going to do, I'm doing the exact same work. I'm teaching the clients the exact same things that I would have taught them, but two different things. One, instead of group coaching, it's one-on-one and I do done with you. So I'm showing them and teaching them how I do it and recording the session. So the next time they need to do it, they don't need to pay somebody to help them. But then also we do just what they need, just when they need it. So that is the big thing that I needed to learn with my business. And that's not to say, I think at some point I am putting the modules together and I'm starting to add them to my portal and I will have a group coaching arrangement at some point, but like, if I wanted to say, you know, failure to launch, that really was a failure to launch. I could not launch that course because nobody wanted it. And that's kind of like a kick in the stomach because you really know it's good information. You know, it would help people, but it was, like I said earlier, it wasn't in the format that they wanted. It wasn't what they needed. So that's my uh, non-accounting, but uh, kind of a bruised business owner, uh, little word of advice is it is so important to know what your clients want and in what flavor do they like it? Because there's also the the problem of like, for instance, I found out that they didn't want the course and they wanted to know how to do it today. Well, I had the option of doing done for you. Like, okay, you want that done? It's going to take this much time. I'm going to, it's going to cost this much money. Here you go. Let me do it. Hand it over. Well, that still wasn't doing what I wanted to do which was not only getting the work done, but teaching the client. So you still have to, even when you pivot, you have to make sure that your pivot not only gives your clients what they want, but make sure that you're giving your clients what they want. So in other words, they need to get what they know, what they think they need. And you have to feel like you've given them what you wanted them to get, which in my case is an understanding and a comfortable feeling and being able to do these things themselves. What they want is they want it done and they want to know how to do it nominally because many of the things we do in our business setting it up is only you only do it once. And for instance, like when you create a subdomain, you don't create subdomains every day. Uh, When you set up Stripe, you only set that up once. When you connect things together, you only connect them once. So the client honestly doesn't need to know how to do that again because once they've connected their Stripe to their autoresponder, it's done. But they do kind of want to to be a part of watching it and seeing it happen so that they understand it. And I think it also gives business owners a sense of calm because even though you can't do it yourself, you've seen it done, you see it working and you can kind of like just a nice exhale of relax. Okay, that's done. So that was my pivot. And so Terry, I know you're saying failure to launch and what you said, uh, bring, yeah, learn how to bring things way down that that's exactly right. Because again, we are doing what we're really, really good at. And that's why it's so easy to us. And we're helping people who need what we know how to do because they don't know how to do it and they don't understand it. So it's very difficult sometimes to go back in your mind to where you didn't know it either and be able to meet them where they are and use words that they understand and to under, to really emphasize with them. So anyway, <coughs> excuse me, that is my little uh, stick here on not only accounting, but also the, the, the subscriptions audit, please do that. You'll be surprised how much you're spending that you don't know you're spending, or you might be spending double. Like you might've tried product A back, you know, last January, and then somebody turns you on to product B and you go, oh yeah, yeah, that's much better. So you switched over to that in August, but you never canceled product A. So you're actually still paying for two. So those types of things. And I know uh, many of the things that we use are relatively inexpensive, but if you look at, you know, 20 bucks a month for a year, that's $240. And if you didn't use it, that's just really basically money thrown out the window. 
So think of it in terms of not the $9.99 a month, but think of it in terms of your overall financial stability and saving and eliminating expenses that you don't need. And that will make you financially stronger. All right. Well, it was lovely having you guys here today. Please uh, leave me any messages if you would like some help with setting up your accounting system or if you have questions in your existing accounting system, please message me and I'll be very happy to give you some advice. Okay, so I will see everybody next week. And remember, you don't have to wait till next week to uh, ask a question. I check the group at least twice a day, sometimes three and I always get back to you very, very soon. So uh, if you do have something that you would like me to demonstrate in next week's live, let me know ahead of time and I'll get prepared. And otherwise, uh, have a great week, everybody. And I'll see you next time. Bye. <laughs>